What's up guys? So I participate in a lot of social media groups where people are asking the question, how do I build an off-grid system for my camper, for my cabin? I want to have some power. I want to run some LED lights. I don't need anything fancy. And there's a lot of stuff out there that can really um, cost you some money and time and grief. I see a lot of the same pitfalls, the same mistakes. I see people perpetuating misinformation unknowingly. Um, so what I'm going to do here is go through step by step in this video, a one stop shop to design, uh, size, select product and put together a small off grid solar system. Don't do it, man. So before we even get started, I feel obligated to tell you that you don't even need to watch this video. You can basically go to a reputable solar distributor and they will do all of this hard work for you and basically sell you everything you need and tell you how to put it together with great customer support. Um, now, if you're, if you're the type that wants to do it yourself, then watch on. But you could go to a Backwoods Solar, Northern Arizona Wind and Sun, Wholesale Solar, Alti, any one of these places, and, and there's more. Um, I, I can't name them all, but there's more. Any one of those places will do great for you. So here we have my system uh, that I designed for my RV. Uh, you can see it's incredibly portable. Um, I carry the panel separately. I plug it in when I get together. Um, I've got these ring terminals for the battery. I've got Anderson connectors in here uh, for easy disconnect and attach. Uh, these are my PV cables. And we're actually going to design something better than this. Uh, time as uh, technology has progressed, Morningstar has come out with a Gen 3 that has some really awesome features. We're going to incorporate that. So now we're going to figure out how much power we need. We're going to figure out how big our battery needs to store it. We're going to size our panels, we're going to size our charge controller, and then we're going to select products and put it all together. Step one is to size your loads. This is a real life scenario based on my RV. These are actual um, usages and these fixtures are in my RV. We've got LED lighting, a fantastic fan, a propane fridge that actually draws a lot of DC power, a water pump, a furnace fan, and a range vent. Column C shows the hours per day that I intend to use these items. Column D is the amp draw. Column E is the voltage at 12 DC. And column F is what you get when you add it all together. Then when you add each individual fixture, it adds up to 319 watt hours. Whoa, what just happened there? How did we get to watt hours? Remember that volts times amps equals watts, which is an instantaneous value. Once you add hours into the equation, you have watt hours. That means we need to have 319 watts available for one hour. So now we're gonna take 319 watt hours and figure out how much battery we need. First, we need to convert that into 12 Volt amp hours. A quick note, a lot of people like to talk in amps, but remember that amps are basically meaningless unless you know the voltage of the system. So to convert 319 uh, watt hours into amp hours, we're going to divide by 12 volts. That's going to give us 27. Now we need to say how many days that we need this system to operate without sun. For me, I leave on a Friday and I come back on a Sunday. So I'm going to do two days, but don't just do that because I did it. Do whatever your usage needs to be. If you're going to go someplace for four days fairly often, then do four days of autonomy. Um, so I get, after I multiply by two for two days, I get 53 amp hours. The next thing we need to correct for is the depth of discharge. For flooded lead acid batteries like I use, we want to go no lower than 50%. So we're going to divide by our depth of discharge, which is going to give us 106 amp hours. That rounds nicely to 105 amp hour group 27, which is a pretty common deep cycle battery. Now what if I wanted to use lithium phosphate batteries instead of flooded lead acid? All I would do is change that depth of discharge to whatever the manufacturer says you can discharge to. 
uh, maybe 95%. I'm not an expert on lithium phosphate. Maybe you want to only use 30% of your batteries to make them last longer. In that case, change that number to 30%. So we're going to pick this 105 amp hour Group 27 Trojan battery. If for me, I'd actually pick this Crown battery because I really like Crown. And if you're anywhere near Fremont, Ohio, you can go right to the factory and buy one for wholesale price. So the next step is to size our panels. Um, what we're going to do is take our one day usage, multiply it by 12 volts to get our watt hours, 319. We have to replace 319 watt hours in one day. So what we're going to do is multiply by the amount of sun hours per day. To get this, you need to look at a solar insulation map. And again, don't use what I did. Use what makes sense for you. If you mostly camp in the summer or go to your cabin in the summer, then use your average summer hours. If your usage is in winter, use winter hours. Or if you go year-round, use an average for year-round. Or use winter to make sure you always have power. Um, once you get your 80 watts per panel, unfortunately, you don't get nameplate power off of solar panels. So we're going to divide by 67%. This accounts for panel efficiency, loss through the wires, and charge controller efficiency. Once you've selected your equipment and sized your wires, you can actually make this factor whatever you need it to be, but for now 67% is a pretty good factor for general use. So once we divide by 67%, we find out that we need 119 watts of panels. So I'm not going to tell you which panels to buy, but you can basically find 12 volt panels for $1 per watt shipped. Um, I've bought some panels from Fred 480V on eBay and I also have a nice Kyocera 150 watt panel. So far as I could tell the only difference was that the eBay panel had 12 gauge wire whereas the Kyocera had 10 gauge wire. I actually ran the math and for that short of a run before you connect to your PV cable it doesn't really matter that much. So I think you're okay buying, uh, buying a panel that you find on eBay or the internet. The only thing to note is that a lot of times these panels aren't UL listed. So if that's important for you, if you think you might be in an insurance claim situation someday, um, maybe you want to spend extra to get a UL listed panel. Otherwise, they seem to work just fine. I've compared the output. They don't really make much of a difference on output as far as I've found. Because we're using the PWM controller, you do need to make sure you get a 12 volt panel. The way you can tell is to look at that VMP on the sticker like this. It'll be somewhere in the range of 17 to 19 volts. So the next thing we need to do is figure out what size charge controller we need. Charge controllers are rated in amps, so we're going to take our 120 watts of panels, divide by our nominal system voltage, which is 12, and we get 9.93. We're going to round that up to a 10 or 15 amp controller. We're going to go with 15 amps because that's a nice size. It leaves some room for expansion and you can get a lot of good choices at 15 amps. Selecting a charge controller and a battery are probably the two most important things you can do. I can't stress enough how important it is to get a quality charge controller. Yeah, so I was browsing through Amazon and I saw this all powers kit for $19.99 or $18.99, uh, 20 amp PWM um, charge controller. Don't even think about it. That thing will slowly kill your batteries. Uh, batteries don't die, they're murdered, and that controller will murder your batteries. There might be one that's a MPPT. Don't buy that either. Uh, save yourself money, hassle, frustration, a trip to the cabin where all of a sudden you find out your batteries are dead. Avoid all that and just trust me, get a reputable charge controller. It's the lifeblood of your system. So if you're in that 15 to 30 amp range, I strongly suggest this Morningstar ProStar 15 Gen 3 with the meter. Um, this thing has so many awesome features and it's crazy reliable. Uh, when an engineer needs to spec out a remote communication system, um, he's not putting a Renogy controller in there. He's putting a Morningstar in there because that thing needs to work when people can't get out there to, to troubleshoot it. Uh, these things are just reliable and they have a lot of nice features. 
this has passive cooling, it has data logging, you can over panel it, it's got programmable charging, lighting control, um, it has a built-in meter, and you can do auto or manual equalize. I could go on and on forever. So yeah, Morningstar is awesome. Why haven't you heard of them? Um, they make the best product on the market, but unfortunately, they don't know anything about how to market their amazing solar products. I'm pretty sure that all the Morningstar engineers were having coffee one morning, and the last guy to do this got stuck making their YouTube channel. Seriously, Morningstar, if you're watching this, um, hire, hire a recent college graduate. Uh, you can probably pay him in lattes and Apple products, but seriously, anyone can do better than you're doing. You have the best product out there. I would be screaming it from the rooftops. Let the world know. You guys are amazing. Um, but you are by engineers for engineers all the way. You've got to appeal to the consumer market, please. People are buying crap. Here's another one that I think looks cool just from reading the manual. Um, it's weatherproof. It has lighting control. A lot of neat features that I think are worth a try. So if you if you don't want to do a Morning Star, um, then go with a Midnight or an Outback or just just go with a reputable brand. Basically, go on to a good solar wholesaler and if they carry it it's probably good if they don't carry it it's probably not good don't go buy something on amazon uh, amazon for solar is not the place to be you're going to pay more money and you get something that's not that great now is probably a good time to tell you that you don't need to waste your money on an mpp controller you've probably heard a million people tell you or write to you on facebook or social media that you need an mppt well, they're all lying to you. The reason is simple. It doesn't make financial sense. An MPPT controller gives you an average of a 15% increase. For this size of system, going from, say, the ProStar 15 to a SunSaver uh, costs $91, or going from the ProStar 15 to the ProStar 25 MPPT costs $166. So we can almost double or more than double our watts of solar for the price that we would pay for an MPPT. It just doesn't make sense. The object is to charge your battery. It's not to maximize the efficiency of your system because it doesn't make financial sense to do it at this size. The break-even point is somewhere above 30 amp controllers. But for this area, don't worry about it. You don't need it. Don't listen to all those people. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some other components that you're going to, going to want to get. These ring studs you can get for about 60 cents each. You're going to connect them to your wire uh, that goes from your battery to your charge controller. So after those ring studs, we're going to need wire to connect our battery to our charge controller. There's no mystery to how this is done. Go online, get a calculator, and enter in your specs. Um, I put 14 volts. Maybe you have a sealed battery that's going to bulk out. Uh, 15 amps at 14 volts and um, what we come up with is 10 gauge and we get about 1% voltage drop which is great uh, in between the batteries and the controller you really want to keep that drop low even lower than that 3% guideline because you can affect your charging set points um, if you don't do this here so say you want to charge at 14.5 volts well if you have enough drop you might be able to drop that down to 14.4 14.3 and you really don't want to do that um, you want to be precise uh, when you're charging your battery so the best controllers on the market have what's called voltage sense wires and what that means is, is say you want to charge at 14.5 it might calculate your voltage drop for you by using these small wires and it might send out 14.6 or 14.7 so it gets to your battery at the right voltage. Between the battery and the charge controller, we're going to need circuit protection. A lot of people use fuses. I think you should spend a little bit of extra money here and get a midnight baby box and some midnight DC breakers. The way that we're going to size this breaker, which is between the controller and the battery, is to make it the same size as the charge controller so that it protects both the controller and the wires. So the next thing we need to do is size our wire between our controller and our solar panels. Uh, remember I said we need 120 watt panels. Um, however, 
these uh, high-tech panels on eBay are a really good deal and this is what I have in my system so we're gonna run the numbers for these remember the 18.73 volts and the 8.62 amps so again we go to the wire size calculator we plug in our values and we see that 10 gauge wire is going to give us a 1.39 percent voltage drop which is well within our allowable range so it just so happens that most solar wire is 10 gauge we can buy a 30 foot section and cut it in half one half goes to the positive on your panel and the other half goes to the negative i suggest labeling your wires since they're both black and you don't want to get them confused we're also going to need circuit protection between the panels and the charge controller. We're going to use that same baby box and put another breaker in and run our wire through. Um, the way we size this breaker is we take our 8.62 amps, we multiply it by 1.25 to give the allowable margin per NEC, and then we round up to 15 amps. Now we're going to check to see that our breaker size is safe to use with our wire gauge size. So I got this off Sarah Wire online, and you can see that a 10 gauge cable can carry up to 30 amps, so we're good there. You should always get in the habit of doing this. You've always got to make sure that your breaker size never exceeds the capacity of your wire. From this point, connecting everything together is really easy. Always start with a battery. Take the battery positive wire to the breaker and then to the charge controller positive. The negative from the battery can go straight to the controller negative. From the controller, take your PV wire, the positive goes to the breaker and then the PV, and the negative can go straight to the panel. On my picture, ignore the wires. Don't get thrown off by that. I've copied the wiring convention from my RV, which does it backwards and in a way that makes no sense. But what I want to show you is how well everything's labeled on the controller. It's really easy to see where to put everything. On the breakers, you'll see something like line and load. Uh, line will be from your panels and load will be going towards the battery. That's how you know which way to run the wires through the breakers. So now that we've selected everything, uh, let's look at this halfway decent, and I mean halfway, not full way, halfway decent Renogy kit and compare it with what we just spec'd out. You can see that we're getting better components for less money by building one ourselves versus buying one on Amazon. If you like this video, please like and subscribe. It really helps me out. I'd like to make some more videos showing how to expand this system, how to add an inverter, and how to do some other stuff that I think you'll find helpful. Hey, thanks for watching. I'd love to hear from you if you have any questions in the comments section.